Hi, this is Paul. Uh, my channel certainly turning is turning into something of a vlog. Uh, Jacob complained yesterday on our little live stream that I, I haven't been putting in the requisite time for videos to give you two and three hour videos at a sitting, even as Mark celebrated that, you know, I just released a little 45 minute job yesterday. Well, this one will be more of a 45 minute job. Sorry, Jacob. Um, often I sit down um, after I do my day job, do some of my sermon work, talk to some of the people in the community. Um, I was talking to Billy outside there, who was particularly awake today, and we could talk a little bit about his circumstance and um, living out on the what one homeless person called the foundation of the Lord. Um, Billy's been on ever since Daniel has was pretty much able to move Daniel off, and Daniel is actually living in a transitional housing situation. Billy's been here and. Um, yeah, he was singing a little bit earlier and just sitting here pondering a 75-year-old African-American man singing Danny Boy to himself. It's a strange world. It's a global world. And a couple of a couple of videos I listened to this morning gave me some thoughts. Yesterday, I um, after our little Thief in the Night live stream, I jumped into the Awakening from the Meaning Crisis Discord server question and answer for John Verveke. And so it's always good to hear John's voice. Um, it's fun to watch a small community like that operating, and it's delightful to see someone like John giving them his time and his attention and, and a lot of loving care. Um, on that question and answer, it'll, which will probably be posted on YouTube in a little while. There's a little YouTube channel just for that with a, less than 500 subs. He talked about you know, what he's thinking about in terms of his, his retirement plans. He wants to learn Greek so he can read Plato in Greek, um, a whole variety of other things that, that he'd like to do. But, but he talked a bit about transformation, and that touched on this video that was released on Rebel Wisdom and got a fair amount of Twitter traffic this morning. Damian Walker had something to say about this guy and his podcast. I'd never heard of him before. Damian's decoding of the podcast of Decoding the Gurus. My take, decoding the, um, decoding the Gurus put me in mind of Omar Little from The Wire, drug dealer who robs other drug dealers. They're the same as their marks, but more so, which makes them both cooler and more dangerous. So truly critique, um, to truly critique the sometimes absurdly wide knowledge claims of their targets so that deco decoding the, the gurus are stuck doing is picking on various rhetorical devices or argue or argument structures their targets are using, which is itself doesn't prove much. The test of decoding the gurus would be, do they take on targets that their audiences won't be entertained by them taking on? It's tough being a critic. You're doomed to offend the people whom you cheer, who cheer you today. Then they hand you to the head. Then they hand you the hemlock. A true critic is never a popular critic. Um, Damien had a very interesting conversation with Peugeot on Rebel Wisdom about science fiction. That was a contender at one point for some video commentary. Might still come up again. So, you know, I, I continue to be impressed with how David Fuller. How David Fuller manage, manages himself in this space. He has, um, you know, he he. It's very easy. Boy, there's there's so much stuff that's rolling through my head right now. So one of the things discussed on CRC Voices today. Well, wait a minute. I don't even have. Well, I got to change this. You can't even see me. Oh, here I here I am. <laughs> One of the things that we've been discussing on CRC Voices is the Calvin Seminary Forum that came out and talking about leadership. And of course, leadership was a um, was a big piece of today's Substack. 
And I entitled today's Substack the same as the title of, of the video I released today. But the Substack is always sort of sort of the next click of the dial beyond the video because I'm I'm thinking about the video. And um, in today's video, I follow up on yesterday's video on Doug Wilson. Um, this post by Mark Galley last October, I talked about that a little bit. I read from it in the blog. Um, I worked through a little bit of the Power Escape Dominion stuff. Um, uh, go to the uh, Miroslav Volf go to that I usually hit on, but but I do I do all of this in the context of a church, and I I I sent John Vervecki an email and said hey, let's let's do it let's do it let's do a chat on this experience of of having lived our entire career in an institution and then having at least a little bit of success. Of course, our numbers aren't what Jordan Peterson's numbers are. I mean, even in the question and answer, uh, John sort of pulled back from the word rocket in terms of the, the change in his status uh, fueled by social media. But but that, that, that struck me uh, as I was listening to this. So let's listen to just a few minutes of this thing one is to to recognize that there's always a spectrum of activities and that you're on those spectrums with everyone else but also that there really are outliers there are people who are not like you and me or many of the people listening to this and it's often hard for uh people to model the mental <laughs> uh, logic of people who are very different from them. And I think that some of the people that we cover... Now, now, he's basically making a point that's similar to what Jordan Peterson makes often in terms of people are on a personality spectrum and it's 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 perhaps something of a bell curve, but there are people at the ends. And those people at the ends tend to, especially in, let's say, a broad platform like social media or like YouTube, those people at the ends will tend to actually be shot up a hierarchy sometime. Uh, you know, Jordan Peterson is a rather odd duck in many ways, as, as are as are many of us. I mean, look look at my beard for Pete's sake. Can it can it be more ridiculous than this? Um, and and he and this individual makes the point. Well, people don't realize that a lot of these gurus, and he's decoding the gurus. A lot of these gurus are outliers. And I hear that and say, "Duh! Of course they are. That's 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 what we tend to listen to. Your your pioneers are almost always outliers. They go and do things and say things that normal, regular people don't do." That's why we pay attention to them. And so basically our outliers either get exalted or killed or both so that a lot of the normies in the middle don't have to. On our podcast, not all of them, but some of them really are very different from ordinary people um, and the things that drive them and the dynamics that they instill in their audience are things that normally people wouldn't encourage or you know they they wouldn't seek out so so i think it's it's definitely good not to like imagine that you are immune from all of the you know biases or, or group dynamics that you might criticize but it is and, and now these biases and group dynamics this is this is where you know i reflect on what the last four years of being on social media has done to me and for me. It's certainly done a lot for me. In, in many ways, this is some of the most exciting and interesting ministry of my life. But not in every way, because there is something deeply fulfilling about local ministry that online ministry will never have, and there's something deeply disorienting about online ministry that local ministry sort of prevents you from it's a terrible way to say it but there it was i don't write this stuff out in advance it is okay to say some people uh, like lean into those dynamics in a way that others wouldn't 
and and the gurus do it like to often an extreme extent uh, and and that's why in fact some gurus um, some gurus have status rockets lit under them by forces far greater than us um at least the people we cover yeah but i also wonder how much of that is a kind of feedback loop of some latent kind of characteristic that then under the the pressure of something like audience capture or late life fame or any of these kind of other dynamics that you get online then sort of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy like i do think that things can become more extreme and maybe kind of latent personality characteristics that weren't fully realized can can get worse and we've seen that with with people now david has made points like this many times and they're really important points and david of course before he ran rebel wisdom and did this thing in the alternative sense making space let's call it or as he calls it you know was involved in mainstream media and so his his perspective is is different let's say from let's say someone like myself who um, has worked for years in uh, relative obscurity. I mean, I, I was certainly known in my de denomination a little bit. And, but, so David had plenty of opportunity to see people who, to see how people respond to the kinds of fame from mass media a generation before YouTube famous became a thing, or let's say internet famous from TikTok or Instagram or Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I guess I would want to pause and recognize that the way that, let's say, regular, um, <laughs> regular fame, let's say modern fame from records or television or uh, the various ways of getting famous before social media became a thing, before influencers were around, let's say movie stars, rock stars, politicians, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you read Neil Postman, he'll make the observation that until the advent of the newspaper, the combination of the newspaper and the telegram, very famous people could travel about America in relative obscurity because hardly anyone would know what Thomas Jefferson looked like. So there's a lot going on here, especially in terms of the, the nexus between technology and sense-making. But giving a sports star or, a, or an actor or a rock star millions of dollars and an enormous amount of fame very much did provoke transformations within them, often not terribly good ones. You know, it's, it's almost a, a, a cliche that the rock star has to go into rehab by 27. The percentage of People who I, I read somewhere something like three quarters of retirees from the NFL are divorced or bankrupt two years after they retire or both. So this these hierarchies and these status rockets are not nothing. And part of what social media has done is sort of filled out the hierarchy from below. So myself, uh, someone with a YouTube channel with 20,000 subs. And, and, and subscribers is not necessarily a, a great way of measuring what it is we're trying to measure. But the transformations that can happen are significant. Now, part of my frustration with the ongoing talk about, let's say, transformations, which is kind of the a secularized version of what Christians talk about when we talk about conversion, but, but these trans, these personality transformations or these lifestyle transformations, they, we want to be transformed 
So if, if let's say Rebel Wisdom is the sense making space, and let's say uh, Chris Chris Williamson and and others are sort of the wisdom space, you know, the, all the the Stoic channels. Um, Robert, what was his name? Robert Green, who was just on on Jordan Peterson before. They're sort of the wisdom space or the men's wisdom space. Transformations should be towards something. There should be there should be a directionality. It should be towards wisdom. And and in Christian circles, of course, it should be towards the image of Christ or godliness or the kinds of transformations that we look for in saints. I want, I want to keep going because David goes a bit more. It's just a short clip. Well, um, let's just take James Lindsay for, as an example. Like He's certainly not the same person now that he was two years ago or four years ago, even though you can probably look back and think, yeah, you can kind of see some of the telltale signs. So I do think that there's a kind of feedback loop that gets activated with a lot of uh, these people. I mean, I just want there's... to say... Yeah, oh, sorry. I, uh, I I only wanted to interject in the case of the GMs that you know I don't want to distant distance diagnose him. I, like I think his personality disorders are available for any user of Twitter to see each day. But um, but I I do think that when, like you said, if you interacted with James Lindsay a number of years ago, for example, he politics were quite different and his reach was substantially less than what it is now but there um there's an interview and i would encourage anybody that wants to you know check my assessment listen to his interview with the very bad wizards um the the two academics that have a podcast they interviewed him back in the original when he had the conceptual penis paper uh kind of mocking you know the, the like feminist uh, what it, like the uh, postmodern scholarship and uh, and they were they were gen they were generally critical of postmodern approaches but they they raised some very valid critical points with that particular endeavor like the the meme one being that it was published in a pay to play journal which you just pay money and they publish so it doesn't really prove what he wanted to set out but his not to critique that such journals exist. The action to the criticism was very, like, it was not what you would normally expect. And it, it came across as very sensitive, very thin-skinned and, and narcissistic, to be quite plain about it. And I, I think what you are saying about, you know, the feedback mechanisms, if you have a kind of narcissistic personality, and you go on to a social media account which based around driving content, getting followers, and you know being cheered on. It's it's like a honey trap for you. But you that personality feature is everybody has a bit of a narcissist inside of them, but not everyone is Donald Trump. And James Lindsay has gone. You know he was picking fights with the Holocaust memorial site. That's not a normal person. Most people wouldn't do that even if their politics match james lindsay they they wouldn't do that you know he would and uh i i yeah so it's it's a warning case but i don't think most ordinary people would go there yeah and i want to steer directly into the the one of the big questions <laughs> it's it's the it's the famous David Fuller, yeah, but that's always, always his transitions. I always, um, I always kind of chuckle when I when I hear him. And and we get used to the the idiosyncrasies of the people that we that that we watch that we watch quite a bit. Part part of it is orientation. I was thinking about I was thinking about this the other morning when I woke up. And when I wake up in the morning, it's usually. You know, first thing is first thing is prayer, and then it's um, and and then it's time for thinking and reflecting and um, considering what I might say to you, my internet audience, who have transformed me as I've been trying to transform you, hopefully in a good way. A little a little business thing: avoid, preserve, achieve. 
it's really a, it's really a fairly smart way to try to take this world that is too large and bring it down to something. You know, part of the the trick of of why religions uh, talk about God. And this goes back to a video I made a few years ago with John Verveke. God is sort of the ancient the ancient resolution to the frame problem. Because the frame problem, again, is that the world is too big for us to actually engage with it productively. So we have to frame it. And once we have framed it, then suddenly we can engage the whole by engaging the part, or at least engage the world by engaging a part of it productively. And in some ways, the idea of God is a way of, of doing exactly that. Because if you relate to God, you relate to the whole world by relating to that which is on top. And, yeah, there's, there's a lot more I could say about that, but it goes beyond what I wanted to say about this. Because when I, when I work with people pastorally, whether online or in person, the, we're, we always run victim to the, the tyranny of the immediate consciousness. Uh, what, what, what exactly is the life you've always wanted? How can it be described or imagined? In many ways, this, this is what religion is all about. We focus mostly on what, on, on what it is we want to avoid or the particular things that we want to add. This is Jordan Peterson's idea that we see, we see obstacles and opportunities. And, and the tyranny of, of consciousness sort of focuses us towards that. It would be nice to avoid Mariupol. It would be nice to win a lottery ticket. It would be nice to avoid cancer. It would be nice to be better looking or healthier or stronger or live by the ocean. Mariupol is, in fact, by the Black Sea, um, which shows you the way things can go. Uh, it would be nice to avoid divorce. It would be better to have a better relationship with my spouse, my kids, my parents, my boss, my neighbor, et cetera, et cetera. And so from here, we sort of go out and and we try to we try to work on this life. And this is where we get sort of the um, the uh, the dead reckoning. Uh, proximal betterment question, but we can't just focus on the little. We have to focus on the large. And when it comes to transformation, it's it's always well. Am I being transformed into something better? And and how are the how are the passive the passive areas of my life the the arenic areas of my life in involving that. Am, am I being, am I becoming, again, it, within a Christian frame, you have a target. And I began, and am I becoming more like Christ? Well, of course, that's, and I think in Christianity, you can sort of see how then in Christianity, Christ becomes the answer to this frame problem. Because in terms of transformation and betterment, that's the goal. Now, obviously, someone can say, well, you know, there's four fairly short gospels, but then you have all of the Christian tradition, and you have saints, and you have personality, and you have all of those things, and you have your engagement with the world and the world that you leave behind, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's amazing that everyone is talking about Will Smith and Chris Rock and the incidences on the Oscar stage. Of course, everybody looks at the slap. I watched the acceptance speech of the Oscar, and it's a. I also watched Joe Rogan's um, piece on it, which which was also very interesting. And 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 like this, there is there is so much to be said, and how this one little incident, um, you know, you can almost see the the agent and the arena unfold between Will Smith and his wife, as he first, of course, laughs at Chris Rock's joke and then sees her and she doesn't jump up on stage and smack um, Chris Rock. That, that, that in some ways would be um, more culturally appropriate. But no, her, 
her husband goes and does it for her. You very much have the the feminine arena and the masculine agent. And then, of course, he gives his speech and he gives a nod to to Denzel Washington, who is um, is is well known in Hollywood for his um, his religious beliefs, and it, it's just easy to have hot takes on on someone like Chris Rock or Will Smith, but also a fair amount of compassion for him. Everything in his life, he said, "Well, what what does he have to?" What does he have to deal with? I don't, I really don't know. But all of life sort of boils down into this one moment and the night that should be your, the, the pinnacle of an acting career is, is marred by your behavior not too long before. All of this probably will, will go, hopefully will go into some sort of into a whole bunch of transformations in his life, in his marriage, um, hopefully in his relationship with Chris Rock, his relationship with others to figure out, okay, what does it mean to be transformed? I think, of course, of Romans 12, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. James Curtides, I should should really get to know how to pronounce his name, but he's... um, He's in this little corner, and he's been he's been following pretty hard on the Alexander Dugan beat, and he had this. Um, he was here. He reads an interview. Let's let's jump into that from the German magazine Deutsche Stimme, the German Voice. Again, this was conducted in March first, twenty twenty one. Before we get started, I'd like to just put the caveat that I do not. Uh, support any particular views. This is for informational purposes only, for ed- educational purposes only. Just wanted to share this information out there as I think this interview is quite illuminating uh, in the ideas put forth by both Klaus Schwab and kind of the rebuttal by Alexander Dugan. It's entitled The Great Reset and the Great Awakening. It was conducted by Alexander Markovics and the link to this interview will be in the description. So we'll get started here. In the following interview with the Russian philosopher Alexander Dugan on January 2nd, 2021, conducted for the German magazine, The German Voice, we were discussing the new globalist strategy called the Great Reset. Since it is embedded in the political framework of liberalism, we also discussed its philosophical framework as well as object-oriented ontology and the latest philosophical theories of Professor Dugan regarding the radical subject. Questioner. Dear Professor Dugan, the global elite is discussing a strategy called the Great Reset, which calls for a reset of capitalism and the post-liberal system after its failure during the corona crisis. For this purpose, capitalism shall be made more sustainable in order to keep the open society alive, but also more repressive in order to gain even more control over everyday life and install a system of mass surveillance. What do you think about this new project, which is intended to save globalism? Professor Dugan, I think that this is precisely not a new strategy, but a new term of the globalists. In the history of globalization, the term reset is a very interesting concept. The content is the same as the New World Order, globalization, one world, end of history, the promotion of ultra-liberal values. The content of the Great Reset differs not too much from the content of globalization. But we need to understand that globalization is not just a technological, geopolitical, or political process, but also an ideological process that unites different levels. For example, this means that every country and every society is transformed into the West. That is very important. Westernization was a great part of this globalization because that is a projection of Western values and Western society on all of humanity. So in globalization, the West is taken as example. The second level of globalization is a projection of modernization onto Westernization. That means it is more and more updated version of Western values, not the same Western values as they were yesterday. This is an- now. I think there's there's some huge things that I disagree with Dugan on. The you know especially since it, you know Putin 
Putin calls, Putin calls, you know, he's, he's going to invade Ukraine to save it from fascism and Nazism, which is, which seems completely laughable. But the, but the, the view at least that the globalization continues, and, and part of this globalization is, of course, in some ways, a, an, an attempt to I think in some, and, and this follows from modernity, to sort of rep- replace the frame of God or Christ with some imagined, again, view from nowhere. And, and so that, there, there's a strange inversion that happens where you have this absolute global perspective which also then has to get down into because you need a frame of some kind, and so then it, it goes down into these identity questions. An ongoing process of some special transformation, a change of the Western values and paradigm, and this is important, it is a double process to update the West itself and project an updated version. This is a kind of postmodern combination of the Western and modern. Modernization should not only be applied to non-Western societies, but modernization is also a domestic process in the West. So globalization is modernization as well. The next level should be an ideological shift inside liberal globalization because liberalism is also a process. It's not just the belief in something eternally stable, but it is the idea to liberate the individual from all forms of collective identity. And, and you can see in terms of, I mean, before I've talked about the fact that I, I, one way to describe the current the, the current prevailing religion is sort of a progressive liberationism. And the, the, the trick that goes on with this progressive liberationism is that you have to sort of transform identity elements from one thing to another. And again, I, I don't think Dugan really gets this right, but him pointing it out is is actually pretty important i i think his i think his idea of all of these all of these little competing all these smaller competing cultures which is in some ways inevitable also completely misses the point that so much of what is driving this is our technological advances that globalization certainly has been happening since the Columbian Exchange, as Charles Mann calls it, in 1492 with Columbus, and has been moving since there. But it's also, at each step, been spurred on, obviously, by technological advances. Columbus had to sail in the open ocean via navigation. Oops, bumped into the Americas. They were sort of in the way of getting to um, his goal, which of course was was trade with China. And on since then, we've had change after change, and these changes often brought to us by, by technological development have complete as con- have continued to change the focus. Now how does that there's there's a there's a lot worth listening to in this interview that James um, that James posted and it would be worth its own its own complete commentary if I had the time for it right now. I'll probably listen to it again because in some ways there's some brilliance to it. He's, he's able, and, and you know, it shouldn't be lost on the promoters of diversity, of cultural diversity or multiculturalism, that there are tremendous insights to be gained by listening to people from different cultures. And under those rules, of course, you would have to sort of bow the knee to Dugan and accept all of his answers. But that's not, in fact, what those insights are for and how they can or even should be received. They can and should be received as more information to be weighed and explored and tested and chewed and and processed. Because the Russian experience is not the German experience, is not the English experience, is not the African experience, is not the Chinese experience, is not the American experience. All those experiences are, in fact, worth looking at. Well, how on earth does that relate to anything like this? 
and, and this this is not intended to be a critique against my my colleagues at the seminary. Um, some of whom I know personally, Jewel Maidenblick was a church planter and a little bit ahead of me at seminary, and I worked with him with, with Christian Reformed Home Missions. Um, David Watt Ryler's dam, I don't really know him very personally at all, but a real mentor to my good friend Eric Dirksen, and so if you're a friend of Eric's, you're a friend of mine. And, and on through the pages, you know, Jeff, Jeff Vandermolen, and I've, I've been in his office and chatted with him about things. And, and many of the issues that they talk about in this, in this edition of Calvin Seminary Forum are, are issues that need to be engaged. But once you, once you have the sense of this, of, of the kinds of changes that are going on around us, of the fact that the dominant cultural gurus, which um, this that particular podcast, I've never listened to a single episode, so I didn't know anything about it, but but which they are decoding. And, and in some ways, I'm doing the same thing. You know, this channel got started doing commentary on Jordan Peterson and then on to John Verveke and on and on and on. Um, it... it one of the one of my one of my friends on voices made the comment that almost nothing is said in this entire issue about the denomination with which owns the institution and, and I don't say that as a cheap shot or a criticism even it's just a recognition that the institutions that have formed us or are supposed to contain us have, going back to one of the videos that I made, significantly lost their authority. And, and by that, I mean, you know, much more of what, what Peugeot said in that video. I should replay it because that, the end of that video was really quite amazing. I mean, it's something that people today have such difficulty understanding, but it's like the idea, for example, that like Jordan Peterson jokes about that, not joke, but mentioned that a lot. Like the idea that like women have been oppressed for 10,000 years by men. And that like the, the characteristic of, of relationship between men and women has been like masculine dominance and oppression. It's just, it's just absolute bull bullshit. Like, it and, and on display in the Oscars, Jada Pinkett Smith's disfavor with Chris Rock colonized the body of her husband to go up and smack him which then set up within him, maybe, you know, it seemed initially that Will Smith didn't have a problem with the joke, but when he learned that his wife did have a problem with the joke, the arena switched and he became an agent and acted within it immediately. And that tells you about the relative power of the masculine and the feminine. The masculine may be strong and have upper body strength, but the feminine can wield the masculine. It could never, it could never be sustainable. Like there would always have to be a negotiation between, between, between the, the relationship between the man and the woman. And sometimes it might go a little too much on one side. Sometimes it might go a little too, uh, too little on the other side. But you can't really, you can't hold it in the extremes for a long time unless you supplement it with technology. If you supplement it with technology, then you can go really far in one direction or the other. And that's what we're seeing now with respect to authority. It is not so much that, that that we have lost authority, but authority has been mediated by technology. I mean, the, the kind of authority that you see in the interchange between Jada Pinkett Smith and her husband is a very is a very powerful authority and it's authority that's built on years of marriage commitment uh, raising children and again as as many comedians have noted uh, of all the things you could joke about in terms of their relationship this was a fairly this was a fairly low level joke yet Part of what has happened with authority is it's also authority is always a function in, in some ways of one's view of the arena. What exactly are the outcomes 
where exactly will this lead me? Will Smith goes on stage and smacks Chris Rock, probably in order to, and I don't know, I mean, we're all just speculating, and maybe someday people will talk about it, but whether in fact what they can or would talk about, how to what degree was that operative in an extremely psychological context like that, who knows? But make no, but make no mistake, authority was functional. And, and the fact that 800 years ago, the authority and the sense-making would lie in the church, but now the authority and the sense-making is everywhere via authority. We are, in, we are in a far more complex environment looking to avoid, preserve, achieve, trying to process so many different authorities and live among them and beneath them. So you can create... Yeah. You can create I think like that's that. something, it seems intuitively, it feels like that's connected to use the word organic. It, it just feels like the, the, a computer's not organic and that there's something there, like there's uh, something like quantitative and, and logarithmic or algebraical or, you know, uh, about that whole system that isn't like my relationship to my mother or my boss or the different human persons I encounter. Um, yeah, but it's, it's, it's extension of power. It's always an extension of human power. And so, so let's okay. say in a normal, like in a normal relationship, let's say in a normal, uh, in a normal power relationship, right? There's a leader and there's someone following them. And there's a, the leader asks something of the person following them. And that person kind of follows, maybe they use a little bit of coercion at some point. There's a limit. At some point, it's like, at some point it's just going to break. But if I have a gun, I have way more power over you to make you do whatever the hell I uh, want. I see. Right. If I have a, if I uh, have a military, then I can make, then I can push that further. If I have a system of, of, of uh, spying, if I have a system of, of uh, controlling your, of turning off your bank account, if I have power, if I have material power, then mm -hmm. I can go further in the extreme. If you have the means to, destroy or afford outcomes that are desired to achieve or avoid there's a there's a sense there's a certain type of authority in there now now i want to jump a little bit ahead to to what is what is a truer authority in terms of how it works except authority like i think there's a kind of uh, I guess one of my intuitions was around the adolescent kind of rebellion idea, but also like, I think there's a connection between the more I've learned about Christianity and kind of reflected on my own life, like humility or being brought low and, and submission. Um, yeah. I just, I wonder what you think about why we don't accept authority and what, how we might, how, viewers or how, how we might look yeah. to, to, to come into a proper relationship to it. I mean, the best way is to understand, I think the best way for us to understand is that it's inevitable, right? That authority is inevitable, that we actually, we, we follow authority all the time. You know, every time you stop at a stop sign, every time you drive on the right side of the road, you're obeying authority. You, we obey authority all the time. And so I think that at least becoming aware of that, can help us understand the inevitability of this. Like, like I said, a lot of people who think that they're being rebels and and is they're deluded. They think they are, and they 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 maybe act that way on some vectors, but they are not. Like it's it's a it's a it's a little bit of an illusion, which is based on this padding that we talked about. So I think that that's probably a good idea is to just realize that it's inevitable, and then also understand the negotiation part, or understand that. Authority isn't always just top down. It's just very rarely so, especially in normal authority relationships. Because I need to block, I need to follow your command for it to be authority, right? There yeah, needs to and be I need to of... follow it, but I also need to. Um, how can I say this? It's like 
I need to get something from authority. There's absolutely, if I don't get something from authority, mm -hmm. the only way you will be able to, uh, let's say, enforce. So Will Smith, what was he? He's avoiding, he's, he's avoiding, he's preserving, he's, what, what is he doing with the authority of his wife? And how is that working for him? You know, maybe he's, he's trying to preserve the marriage. Maybe he's trying to avoid divorce. Maybe he's trying to avoid going home and having her say, he disrespected me on stage and what kind of a man are you and you did nothing. It's amazing. All of this talk about violence and toxic masculinity and nothing, not a peep. Plenty of, plenty of talk about, you know, violence and, and what kind of violence should be um, dealt with. But, but this question of authority and where does it lie and, and where do we see it and, and how high do we find it? Of course, your authority will be through brute force. Total brute force. Now, mm -hmm. and brute force is, is, is exhausting. It's tiring. Yeah. Yeah. It takes yeah. your energy. It takes up energy. And so it's, it's, a, it's a simple, it's like it's a, it's a kind of a simple system. And you can see it like, um, you can see it like it's in modern classrooms. Like modern classrooms are great because the teacher doesn't have real authority, like doesn't have normal authority. And they, it's recognized that in a way, the children, the, the teacher isn't an authority figure. Right. And that's in the culture. So the kids, they, they, they'll flip between being screamed at by like a history. Uh, what he says, you know, my wife is a public school teacher. What he says here is so true. Hysterical uh, person to doing whatever they want and not listening to what the teacher says. And it's like, th there isn't because they don't understand it. You have, you have dress codes at school that um, basically the lawyers will tell the principals, these cannot be enforced. And, and so then the teachers play this little play this little theater with the students. And of course, the only way that the classroom actually works and the school actually works is if the, the teachers actually establish with the students the, the, this true kind of authority, which is found through love. Authority. They can't, they don't, even the teacher doesn't understand authority because the teacher is part of this weird, weird world where they, they also think that some they're teachers, but they think authority is bad. You know, it's like, you know, that's, that's not going to work. Um, mm -hmm. so, so they end up like going between extremes, but normally what you would have is that the, right. The students know that if they obey authority, things are going to go better for them and for everybody else. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, then at some point it's also might, they might not continue to, to obey. Like it's just going to, it's going to break down. People will yeah. go somewhere else. And, and so, you know, the challenge, both of the, the blog post I wrote about evangelical leadership, you know, the, the challenge is, is going to be, and the challenge for my denomination is, is going to be the establishment of and the preservation of authority. And, and I think that will happen face-to-face, um, person-to-person. It will, it will happen as we see transformations of individuals moving towards, obviously, as a Christian, moving towards the image of Christ. One, one of the most interesting things about the gospel is, of course, Jesus sort of shows up out of nowhere. He's from Nazareth. What good can come out of Nazareth? He shows up out of nowhere, and the comment about him in his Galilean ministry is repeatedly that he teaches as one with authority. Now, what does that mean? Now, obviously, in the Bible, he's, well, in the Gospel of John, he's the good shepherd. He's he's contrasted with the... Um, the bad shepherds that you can find decried in Jeremiah and Ezekiel that, um, that basically uh, steal from the flock and use the flock for their own advantage. And, and good, shepherds, good shepherds care for the flock. And, and figuring out how to care for the flock in this, in this world of 
dramatically interconnected globalization when even shepherds of the flock will be tested by status rockets and transformations. You know, I, I saw, so friend of mine and colleague, I'll mention my, my buddy Scott Jose. Um, I went to both college and seminary with Scott. He's, he's a delightful man. And for years, he's run the Center for Excellence in Preaching. And I just scanning below in 2021, um, you know, it's content 2.1 million times to individuals in many de denominations spanning over 200 countries reaching the worldwide church. It's a difficult time to figure out authority to know how to lead and to know who to follow. To know how to be transformed into the likeness of Christ whose authority was, was evident immediately by the people. And to live in a time when the you know, when, when there's so much power given by these tools that are, if the pen is mightier than the sword, then the YouTube is, wow, I don't know quite how mighty that really is. Although, of course, it's drowning in a sea of competition and algorithms and analytics looking for attention, looking for views, this, this, this competing for attention, which, again, is in many ways analogous to worship. I don't know what happens to my little denomination that I love. I don't know what happens to my alma mater that I care about, my friends who work in it. But I think this is... This is what we're all called to, called to work on and figure out. Peter, of course, and the disciples are on, are in the boat, and uh, Jesus has gone up to pray. Then maybe the disciples told Jesus, you know, if you're not back by sunset, we're leaving. I don't think they would ever dare talk to Jesus that way. You, you very much get the sense that they were regularly confused and frightened of him. But they head off across the lake, and of course, then Jesus starts, um, he's, he walks home on the water, and Peter sees him. At first, they're terrified, and then Peter sees him and bid me to come. Come on, Peter, step out of the boat. Peter steps out of the boat, takes his eyes off Jesus and starts looking at the waves, and he starts to sink. And he calls out, help me. Jesus takes his hand. Peter, why did you doubt? You have little faith. So, yeah, Esther sent me a note and said, if the two options, she didn't say the beta cools, if the two options are the beta cools or the naughty boys, you know, I'm out. Well, those aren't just the only two options after all. But to figure out authority, to figure out what to do, to have dramatic things on television that demonstrate when you look at the Oscars, you're looking at the stars by which our culture is navigating. And you think, wow, the guy at the top of the pyramid, best actor, has no idea how to handle a joke in terms of the triangulation with his wife. That he's publicly humiliated at the time of his, what should be his greatest ascent. We live in interesting times. My recommendation would be to pray. Leave a comment. This is, this, I have no idea what I think about this video, but, um, 
maybe I'll post it and see what you think of it.